Hi, and welcome to the High Vibration Living Podcast. I'm your host, Chef Whitney Aronoff, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dana Claudette. Dana Claudette is a modern feng shui master and founder of the School of Intention. She studied art history at Stanford University and became a feng shui master over the course of nearly two decades, working with thousands of people around the world. Dana helps her clients design their dream life. She works with their core principles of feng shui and strips down any dogma, confusion, fear, and superstition to get her clients results. Welcome to the podcast, Dana. Thank you so much. Every time I hear that, I'm like, God, that's a long time. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. Yeah. So how did you start your career as a feng shui and kind of manifestation specialist? I really didn't. And that's the interesting thing about it. I was just doing this because I thought it would be a fun thing to do as uh, I was doing it on the side and I wasn't even accepting money for it. I had studied feng shui for my own purposes. I had a lot of issues in my life and a lot of health challenges and I wanted to build a solid foundation for my life. And so I became certified in a Western form of feng shui and I felt like it was fine, but it wasn't the full picture. And I had a depth of, I kind of grew up in this interesting, uh, with this interesting influence of, you know, my mom always had tarot card readers at the house and it was very odd in like the eighties and nineties. And we had like my dad lived in San Diego. So I would go from New Jersey to San Diego and experience vegans and crystal healing and all sorts of things. So I knew things existed that most people around me were just like, what is that? Like it was, it was no internet. No one really knew. Um, and I started reading books. Like my dad had gotten me Shakti Gawain's creative visualization. And I was doing guided visualizations and watching screens with things flashing when I was like 12, 13, 14 years old, like reprogramming my subconscious was something I knew about when I was a little kid. It was just all of this stuff. And um, it was amazing. But if you have a parent who's pushing that on you, who is troublesome, you also start thinking something's wrong with you and you need to fix it. And so uh, it was wonderful. It helped me to certainly surpass anyone's expectations for what I was going to accomplish in my life. But at the same time, it I started approaching all of these tools from a place of being broken and needing to be fixed. And I think that that's where it becomes really problematic. And you start investing a lot of power into all of these other things outside of yourself rather than starting with you being whole and perfect the way that you are, and then using all these things to make life better. So when I had studied feng shui and started working with it, I started doing it for fun, seeing what would happen if I incorporated all that I knew of art and science and all of these different disciplines that I had been exposed to for most of my life and what that would be like. And I was just doing it for free. I started a Tumblr blog. It became wildly popular in like 2007. And again, it was just for fun. It wasn't my job. It wasn't my thing. I was certified, but I wasn't doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like if I was going to do something professionally, I needed to be able to hang a sign up that said, I can hundred percent stand behind what I'm doing. And so I needed to know that my thoughts, my way was even valid. And it didn't occur to me that I would ever cross that line into a place where I had certainty so that I could do this professionally. And it kind of found me. It just, I got sort of swept onto a wave of lots of interesting opportunities, lots and lots of people that wanted to work with me for free. Tumblr opened up this huge Uh, Pandora's box of people and questions and things. And I found myself spending as much time doing all of this for fun as I was doing all of the things I was doing professionally working in the arts. And I was like, you know, what's going on here? Should I, someone was like, are you seriously not taking this serious? And I was like, 
I never want it to be stressful. And I had always equated work with stress. And I was like, I never want this to be stressful. And once I reached a point where I couldn't avoid it anymore, I was like, okay, I can accept the fact that I can have a life where I don't have any stress from anything outside of me. And that work doesn't have to be stressful and that I can create this stuff. And so I didn't set out to do this. I didn't have that in mind. I had in mind how awesome it would be if I had more and more tools and I could actually help people just for the hell of it to live a better life. Like how cool that would be because I struggled for so long with all of it. Like it would be amazing if I could help people make it so much easier. Do you think by using feng shui, no matter where people are in their life, if they start studying and applying these principles to the the place where they live, it will help them clear up the other internal work that they need to do or some of their health issues because they'll ultimately get to a place where they, they face that and make shifts. So I think the way that you phrase it at the end makes a lot of sense. It's that you face things and make shifts. So I don't think that, and I think this is part of the confusion about feng shui. People read these things like, put this in the corner and the love of your life is going to appear and do this. And then all this money is coming and that I've always had like a very distinct distaste for because one, even if it does happen once, what a way to live thinking that you have to have like a purple statue in a corner um, in order for you to have anything good happen for you. But when you start connecting to the power of your home, you start connecting to your power And so by seeing all of the external manifestations, which is everything in your life. So Mm -hmm. anyone listening, everything around you is a reflection of you in some way of where you're at, what you were thinking, and maybe some of it you've outgrown and maybe some of it you have swept aside as clutter and maybe some of it you uh, are aspiring to. So you have vision boards and things like this and all of this stuff around us is in some way connected to us. And when you start making those decisions, like I have outgrown this, let's get rid of it. I am done with this. Like I'm going to let this go. Or you know what? I've been sweeping things under the the carpet for too long. I'm going to open the closets and start clearing them out. That is very door opening for your life. And all of the benefits of just making the physical changes, the space changes that you see that influence you in that way is very powerful. But the level of confront that you have, the ability to confront things just changes so dramatically. And I often hear the word responsibility used in a way to blame, like, you know, you're responsible for this, you did this. But in my mind, it's responsibility on the highest creative level when you start deliberately choosing whether to design what you eat, to design how you live, like when you start making those decisions, instead of just accepting what you're told, accepting what other people say, Um, or accepting how things are and just thinking, well, it's too late for me, or I'm just this way. I'm just messy. The number of people I've met over the years who've come to me and said, I'm just messy. I'm just disorganized. It's just who I am. I'm like, no one was born disorganized. Like it's not just who you are. Um, that is, that's one story. What's the new story. So I'm all about, responsibility in a positive way. And I always say like, just becoming more of the creator of your life. You can't control everything, but there's so much that you can do. You brought up some really good points. I completely agree with you when, when it comes to your health, like you get to, you really do get to decide what you eat every day. Um, and it's really easy to come up with excuses as to why you can't feel yourself with the things that, you know, make you feel good. It's a lot easier to, you know, make excuses and feel like you, you know, had to go to fast food or had to just eat whatever was, you know, old in your fridge, but we can make active choices and plan ahead. So we feel ourselves appropriately, just like with everything, everything else that you mentioned, it doesn't have to happen to you. Yeah. And in some cases it takes more ingenuity and it takes a little bit more 
I work with people on every level of life, regardless of there are people who are, you know, in their first apartment, there are people who are living in giant mansions. Like it really, it's everyone. This works for everyone. And, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit more inventiveness when you're starting with a budget of zero and you have to kind of make it work with what you have. But I have seen for myself that when I had a budget of zero and I was very committed to making a change, I, the level of focus and intention that I had was so high, almost on in, in, like on a level of uh, intensity, like I need to change this. It was incredible. So I don't want anyone to feel like this is only for, you know, this level of privilege or this level of whatever, like really wherever you are right now, you can take charge of all of these things step by step. And it does take work. Any change takes work. Any change takes work, but the work should feel fun because it's making you feel better. So if, if I wanted to start incorporating feng shui principles to my home, so I can change different things in my life, do I start with just clearing clutter and kind of a deep clean, like where can one just simply start? Um, start by looking at your space and connecting to it a little bit more, like understanding um, how you've been talking about your home, understanding how, just like how we talk about ourselves. A lot of times people don't make changes because they're busy criticizing themselves so much. Everything's wrong. Everything's bad. Uh, and we do this again, that projection into an environment, we do this in our space as well. So I always encourage people to start looking at how they've been relating to their space. When you talk about your home, do you go, oh, you know, I have to put up with this, whatever it is. And it's just all junky and it's all falling apart. And I'm just gonna, it's not, what's the use and all of these things. These are the things before you even start changing stuff is that level of going, I have to really appreciate where I am. I have to see all of the good in what this is providing me on even the most basic levels. And I know when I had that health crisis that propelled all of this to happen in my life, uh, that was really where I started. I was like, before I think about what I have to eat and vitamins I have to take and things I need to do and exercises and all these other mental changes, I need to actually accept me. And that was the hardest part, um, was allowing myself to let go of what I thought was making me a better person. And I think that especially a lot of the achievers and perfectionists listening, listening to this might relate to this, but there's a certain mechanism, I think, drilled into some of our heads that says, if you criticize yourself enough, if you bash yourself enough, if you punish yourself enough, and that's often with food, often with other things, it's all this sense of, I have to be rigorous. I have to be perfect. I have to punish myself, deprive myself. Uh, I have to feel uncomfortable constantly. Uh, and if I don't, then I won't achieve excellence. There's no sense of, I can just be comfortable with where things are. I can be okay with how things are right now. It's not settling to feel good where you are right now. In fact, it's the way to not settle. If you can accept where you are right now, you can really see things. You can really start clearing clutter and all of that stuff. But if you're in your mind hating everything and everything's always wrong and everything's always bad, um, and that's your drive to be better. And that happens so often. This was like the curse in my head. It wouldn't stop. It was everything was always not good enough, not good enough. And no matter what I did, no matter what I organized or cleared or did, it, it started to just all fall flat. And so starting with that acceptance, so looking through your home and going, where have I been so critical? Where have I been so unwilling? A lot of people don't even settle into their space because they think it's temporary. I work with a lot of people who still haven't unpacked everything after a year or two years. And I'm like, the minute you actually move in, you'll be closer to moving out to the next place. But it's so important to move in. 
And, you know, it's always, there's always a calculation we can make. Well, I'll start in the new year or I'll start in the, uh, on my birthday or I'll start at this other time. And the idea is that when you start, it has to be suddenly your whole world changes where suddenly you're the most organized person in the world. Suddenly you accumulate no clutter. We all accumulate clutter. We all have things. We all, you know, eat too much sugar or do something one day. Like it's fine. It's not the end of the world. This, and it's not about everything being perfect. And it really is the sense of acceptance of everything now will help you to actually be able to be at home. You can't really embrace something that you're actively criticizing. You just start putting walls up around you and it becomes very difficult to say, yeah, I'm going to make my home super magnetic, even though I hate it, even though it sucks, even though it's not where I want to live, even though there's all this stuff going on. Uh, and so this is part of that process of transformation is acceptance. And I think that's the key before you start throwing things away or looking at anything else. Um, I want to just put that out there for people because a lot of people think that they fail at decluttering, they fail at keeping things clean, they fail at all of this stuff. And it's just another cycle of judgment. This work, mm -hmm. the feng shui that I created over all these years has no judgment in it. There's no dogma. There's nothing you can do wrong in your home that's going to cause you bad luck or bad fortune or you know, you screw it up and then you have to wait till next year in order to get a fresh start or whatever. Right now, where you are, everything is as it is meant to be. And if you could start from that principle and just see all the good and really see all the good in you, it's going to be so much easier to actually make the changes you want to make. Thank you. That's actually really nice to hear. How do you think one can fall in love with their place? You know, especially for people that are renting that are hoping that that's not their forever home. How can they learn to fall in love with where they are? It's all that the small stuff, uh, you know, seeing all the great, like I remember living in a place that was super rickety, but it had these beautiful built-in bookshelves. It had these beautiful beams across the ceiling and there were all these it was in a fabulous neighborhood where I could walk outside and it was close to things and there was really cool stairways. And so I had like these markers in my mind of all the things that were really great. And I just really embraced them. And then I started transforming things that were less than optimal. If you hate the color of your walls, there's yeah. no amount of wishing that's going to change it. Paint them if you can. And if you can't paint them and you're renting, see if you can get removable wallpaper and see that's the easiest thing you could possibly do. And it's fabulous. And it would look even more exotic than if you painted walls. So you can actually look at all of this stuff that's suboptimal as this creative opportunity. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to invest in a place that's not my dream home. And it's a, a kind of like a rough road because if you are in a place where you don't want to be and you don't make yourself at home, then you're depriving yourself of all the energy and inspiration and all sorts of things that will help you to get to that next place. And it doesn't even take a lot of financial investment. A lot of times it's energy, like you said, deep cleaning, um, decluttering, all of these things, this energy investment, it serves you because everything you do for your space, you're doing for you. I, I always say home care is self-care. Are there things that you like to do or that you recommend to clients as they're learning to fall in love with where they live, like music that they should play, mantras they should play, items that they should burn so they can start to like love and enjoy the space that they're in? So always know that whatever it is that's out of sync with you. So if you feel like, oh, this room is just so cold, like it's so cold in my bathroom, I can't deal with it you can't pretend it's not cold. So this isn't like acting as if, you know, trying to pretend like things are all perfect when they're not. Maybe you get really amazing bath mats. That's a great investment that you could take with you and they're thick and they're plush and they feel so good. And you really get the nicest ones you could possibly get, like the, the best ones you can find. 
And that's amazing. And so now the floor isn't cold when you are walking around in the bathroom uh, in the winter time and you don't have slippers. Maybe you get fabulous slippers for your house and you keep them by the door. All these little things to make it whatever it is that's out of sync with you better. If your space is noisy, is it echoey noisy? Maybe you need a few rugs, maybe some pillows, some throw blankets to absorb the noise. Maybe it is playing music, even just your favorite music. You don't have to play special music that's going to, you know, do something to Mm -hmm. you. Your favorite music, like allowing your space to actually feel like yours. And again, it comes back to the sense of allowing, like, what am I going to allow in? So if you notice things are out of harmony in certain Mm -hmm. spaces, if things are feeling this room feels empty or everything feels flat. What can I put on the walls that's going to bring things to life? And even for renters, there are such easy things you can do with, like you don't even have to put lots of nails in the walls. There are things like command strips that you can use to put up all your artwork, as long as it's not wildly heavy, like a hundred pounds. You can use these very inexpensive things to fasten art on the walls. It leaves no holes, no marks. There's so many fabulous ways. And it just takes a little Googling, a little inventiveness to switch what is out of harmony. The key here is you do want to be in harmony and you kind of can't fake that. Uh, One thing that you asked is like, are there things to burn? Are there things to do? Having any habit, any habit that's not forced Again, it's just like forcing yourself to have a certain breakfast or a certain smoothie and you just don't like it. And it just every day becomes like this. You dread it more and more each day. That's not the energy that's going to create a breakthrough, right? It's just, it's one day or another, you're just going to be like, someone take my blender away. I'm never going to make this anymore. I don't even want to see a smoothie. Rather than forcing yourself to do elaborate rituals or routines that don't really vibe with you, things change over time. You might go through a season where you wake up every day and you light a candle and sit and set some intentions in the morning. And as the candle burns, you imagine that it's kind of waking up the energy in your space. In the fall uh, and the winter, you might want to keep the windows more closed, maybe cracked open for some fresh air for a few minutes. But in the spring and the fall, you might want to open up all the windows, open up everything and have that be a morning ritual where you're just letting all this fresh air come in. So all this, the simple things that you can do to create a little bit more lightness, a little bit more freshness every day, knowing that you can make shifts and it can be really, really simple. Like not everyone needs to have an aromatherapy diffuser and diffuse essential oils everywhere. You could take a little bottle of essential oils like lavender and just put a drop in each corner of a room that you're in and fill it with more grounding energy. So easy stuff that's going to be sustainable whenever anything starts to elaborately my elaborate dive into wellness where it was like, oh, you want me to change everything I eat today? Great, I'll do it. Like when everything starts too intensely, our brain rejects it, our energy rejects it. It's just so much to have to navigate. And so it's really great to ease into things and then learn more ways that you can deliberately clear energy, learn more ways that you can deliberately uh, cleanse away stuff and start bringing more intention into your home. So when you work with clients one-on-one, which I know you have your online school and you have amazing teachings on your YouTube channel and Instagram and TikTok, but if someone wants to work one-on-one with you, where do you have them start? Uh, we always start with what they want. Everyone wants something. Uh, what do you want? That's how it all begins. What do you want? Uh, what are you looking for? And usually people want multiple things. It's very rare that someone, sometimes someone just wants the love of their life or they just want, you know, everything else in their life seems to be going great. Uh, Most people want more money, no matter where they're at. People want more wellness. They want all of these different things. Mm -hmm. And so it starts with intention. Um, Usually we work with between one and three intentions. Cause if you try to change again, everything at once, it's so chaotic. So I like to prioritize. 
that's something that can feng shui your whole life. Start prioritizing more what is most important. Um, it's a, one of the things that used to really trip me up a lot is I would do all of these fabulous things every day and my biggest priorities would come last. Yeah. <laughs> and so really clear on those top three priorities for your life. So not just for your home. I don't, everyone wants to declutter and, and organize and do all of these things. Uh, but I'm interested in your top three priorities for your life. What do you want to manifest? How do you want to be living? And we look at the story that you have been living and you'll talk about the story you've been living, how you've been living, what's been going on. But then also what I find fascinating is I start to see the story in a space. And when we walk through the space together or online, go through the space together, uh, you can see the story that someone's been living and even more detail about it. Sometimes that people don't see in their own home, like other people see things in my home. I don't see in my home. We get very, uh, we have very big blind spots to certain things sometimes. Yeah. So we see the story that people have been living and we decide on a new story and we start bringing that to life using a whole major spectrum of tools from the feng shui elements to uh, lots and lots of feng shui design principles, shifting the space, using all sorts of intentional tools, energy clearing, remediating geopathic stress, which is stuff that makes you feel ill at ease in your home when you never feel grounded grounding the space, bringing people into deep connection with the space. Uh, sometimes people have never fully moved in. So helping them really connect to their home as their home and uh, room by room, we just bring all of that intention, what they want into the space very clearly using all types of feng shui tools. Now, something that I just thought of, you know, we live in a time where, where people's homes aren't all of their, isn't where all their stuff is. Like you mentioned, people struggle to even fully move into their home. Um, people have storage units. How does having storage units and additional stuff that you aren't looking at actually affect your energy inside and out and the energy of your home? That's such a great question. Sense? Yeah. Cause a lot of people ask me, um, in consultations, a lot of people ask me, do we have to include our garage? And I'm like, <laughs> of course, it's a part of your house. <laughs> Even if it's not attached, it's still a part of your house. Yeah. All of your stuff, no matter where it is, is a part of you. Um, the, you know, it's all a part of what you are responsible for to come back to that word, like what you have domain over. And so even if you have things in storage, even if you have things in two different homes or whatever it might be, it's all part of what you're responsible for. And that's a lot of the reason why people have really, I think, embraced this movement of less is more and starting to shed some of that stuff because it becomes a lot to manage sometimes. Like even if you have a storage, you have to kind of check on it from time to time. Usually yes. you have to know that everything, if it's like years and years, that everything's the way it should be, that everything's like, okay, where it is. Um, and you have to pay for it. Your energy is going toward it all the time. It's usually not free. Sometimes you have storage in a friend's house or something else, but that's still energy in their space. And so it's very much, it, I think it's really, really important to be aware of where all your things are, including the garage, the basement, the attic, like the storage units, all of it. And working on getting it to a place where it's essential. And I don't think essential is just, I use it frequently. That's great. If you use something frequently, essential is, I like that idea. Like it sparks joy. That's beautiful. That Marie Kondo idea, but also sometimes things are part of your personal archives. Like, you know, why throw away a dress you haven't worn in 10 years that you were wearing when you met someone or, you know, something else that's part of letters you wrote that were part of personal archives or a journal that was really important. I am a big fan of keeping that stuff because it really is vital. I have lots of clients who've kept these things and later in their life, they reflect back on them. And it's just 
the biggest magic. And so to have the ability to have that stuff where we don't have to be in a rush to let that stuff go. You can let go of the 70 extra candles you have and all the other things like the worn out socks in the drawers and all the other things that we have that have accumulated. But I wouldn't, um, I would, I really, if anyone needs permission to hold on to sentimental objects, I'm a big fan of doing so and being clear that they really are sentimental, that it's not just everything you've ever touched is sentimental. So again, priorities. <laughs> That's so nice. Well, I really like the idea of having three intentions with a home. I never thought of it that way because it's so easy to have so many intentions. So let's say for this conversation, I've whittled down my intentions, but my number one is love. Like I want more love in my life. I want a romantic partner. I want more loving friendships. I want more love in my business. You just want to experience more love and connection every day in your life. How does somebody start tackling that with their home and inviting that into their home? So I, I think it's really interesting. If we were doing this one-on-one, -on -one, my next question to you would be, what has been going on with love in your life? because it's all very personal. For some people, yeah. love is impacted by money. For some people, love is impacted, like not that love is impacted by money, but people are having contentious things in love because of fights over money in their relationships or things like this. For some people, uh, love is impacted by a lack of self-worth, like a lack of self-love. For some people where uh, love is being challenged is, People don't trust themselves. They've had bad experiences with love. They've been betrayed. They've had things happen. And so there's a sense of like a lack of personal wisdom, a lack of trust within yourself. Uh, so why, why? And this is again, taking everything out of, I like to say like, even though this, the work that I do in feng shui, this method, the whole methodology is extremely freeing and it's all about infinite possibility. It's also very personal. Yeah. And if you really want to make changes that make sense, it's kind of like, you can't tell everyone you have to eat X, Y, and Z food. Someone's allergic to something. Someone hates this food. Someone, you know, it has to be specific yeah. and that's the beauty of it. Now, I always say you can come up with that for yourself. Like you don't necessarily need me. You could say, I know why I, what I've been struggling with. Now I want to see how I can shift that story. And so it always starts there because what love for someone who is struggling with self-love and self-care looks like and what that will translate into in a home is very different from someone who has like a contentious uh, work thing that's sucking all their energy away from their love life or someone who has a lot of drama in their family that's sucking energy out of their love life or something else. So it's really specific. So that's where to begin. But this essence of love, like bringing more of that essence of love, what does that really feel like? I love, um, there's a book, mm. A Natural History of Love and uh, Diane Ackerman. And I hope I'm saying that right. I'm almost positive. It's called A Natural History of Love uh, because she also has a great book called A Natural History of the Senses. And in the book, she starts out by saying like, what is this concept of love that we all talk about? Like, it's almost like a catch all for all of these different things. For some people, it's passion and romance. For some people, it's a feeling of safety and comfort. For some people, it's uh, a sense of belonging and feeling like you can be self-expressed and be yourself. Like, what is that feeling, that core feeling you're looking for? And I think that is something that a lot of us don't often stop and ask ourselves because we get so hung up on the fact that like, I want this and we know kind of what it means or we have a sense, but uh, one of the, the biggest, the biggest challenges always to manifesting things uh, isn't a lack of clarity on the thing you want, but often it's, what is it going to bring you? And oftentimes we say, I know I certainly have said, I've wanted things really badly. Like I want this, I want this, I want to get married. I want this, I want all, whatever it was at the time. 
And when all was said and done, I really didn't want the thing I was talking about, uh, or I didn't want it in the way that I was talking about it. There were so many other aspects of it that were going to really fulfill me. And, um, and so that's where we begin, always begin with that sensory stuff. And then you can start saying what, let's just say you, you realize that what you want from love is more passion and also the sense of adventure and inspiration. And it's like, okay, so let's look at your space from the minute you walk in. Like, do I, is this just generic? Do I feel any, any draw to come into the house? Uh, how can I make the entryway feel a little bit more of that feeling? As I look through my home, is there anywhere that I have to do things that are passionate? Like to have whatever it is, whether it's passionate on like a sort of a physical level or passionate, like making art, cooking with passion, whatever it is, all the expressions of this energy. Do I do those things? Am I doing those things? So it's not just what you put in your home design wise, but what you do in your home that's also generating energy. If you have lots of arguments in your home, that energy settles in. If you have lots of like, if everyone's laughing and having fun, you feel like that's that old school saying, like a happy home is like a warm heart, like all of these, you feel that energy that almost gets embedded into the floor and the walls and everywhere around you. So um, yeah, I know these aren't the, the answers that you probably no. thought you were going to get, but <laughs> I love this. You're if, if I'm looking glazed over, it's because I'm literally, cause I'm in my home right now and I'm rethinking everything. You really have me thinking how, so if I want more love in my life, how would that make me feel? And if that's the feeling I want with more love in my life, then how do I create that feeling in my home where I spend so much time? And, you know, is my home inviting as I walk into it? Like, and when you walk up, do you want to enter and see who's inside and come and experience? Like, I, I love the, the therapy session that you almost invite your clients to have with you in order to really create the space they really want. Like you make them do the work and get clear. It's just fun. It's, it's, it's fun. a collaboration. I, I tell, when students enter the school of intention, I always say the first thing is you're not going to ever feng shui for anyone. You're going to do it with them. And that's why they're going to get amazing results because it, no one knows best what is best for you than you. Like I could never tell anyone, even people I've known for 30 years, I could never tell them this is best for you in this room. This is what it is. That's absurd, especially in a place like a bedroom. Like it's let's really zero in. And of course you have all these tools to work with. Like I said, there's a, mm -hmm. so many facets and so much that you can learn that you can work with. But once you get this sense of how this can translate on many different levels, then you can start really you can collaborate. Like you don't need to be a feng shui master to work with me. Like everyone who's never even heard of this before, as long as we, I can get as specific as possible. And I'm sure that you and all the health coaches and, and healers and people listening to this do it in their own ways. Like you help people to really get to that best thing for them, the best habit for them, what will stick. It won't work if it's, just completely out of alignment with what people want, even if it's a good idea. I say to a lot of people, like you could follow every feng shui book and put everything wherever it says, yeah. and your house can still suck. And I, I'm not here to slam what other people do. I've just seen this again and again and again. And it, and I'm saying this to hopefully save people a lot of time and energy because people invest a lot into trying to get all of this stuff perfect or right. And that comes from that old model, right? Where we have to do all these things and achieve all these things before we can then yes. be worthy. That is a very old model. You're completely right. You have to have all these things first and aligned before you can then get what you want. And then that leaves a life unfulfilled because you aren't living the life you really want. 
Yeah. If your whole life sucks until the moment where the man of your dreams appears or the woman of your dreams appears, like, what is that? Yeah. Like, who wants that? Like, I would, always, I just don't want that then. Like, that was always my thought was, I don't want to like be miserable. And I'll, you know, I've made a lot of instinctual choices in my life that weren't always the greatest choices, but as long as I had a lot of fun or learned something really big, I've never really criticized myself for them. And it was, uh, it was very freeing. And this whole journey of doing this with people has shown me that what I thought was uniquely my own sort of prison of my mind, overanalyzing things Mm -hmm. is extraordinarily common. It's like 90% of the people who I work with are trying to get it all right, trying to figure it all out. And we all, we all just want to live our best lives. And we're told that there's a formula, there's a way somehow where it's, there's just one way your best home right now could look a million different ways. It's all about what's going to be most accessible for you. What's going to be most pleasant for you. What are you working on right now that matters most to you? And then you can shift things as you go. And it doesn't have to mean turning your whole life upside down. Like we talked about, like you can't start eating a whole different way overnight uh, and have it stick. But as you ease into this way of living, kind of how we opened at the beginning, it starts to pervade everything that you do. Um, You start looking at all the choices you're making in a different way. Like you start, instead of thinking through everything, you start going, that doesn't feel right. Like Mm -hmm. that's, there's, that's not quite it. And as you start doing this more and more and feeling into all of these things, it becomes a whole different operating basis, which is where things become creative and freeing and really powerful. Well, this is amazing information. If people wanted to learn more from you, can you tell me about what the school of intention is and what they experience by signing up? Uh, yeah, the school is the, the whole thing. It's everything I've learned and practiced in the last going on 19 years now. Uh, and it is from soup to nuts. You do everything for yourself first. So you feng shui your home as you learn each principle, as you learn, uh, every single step of the journey, uh, for the first part of the training, I always tell people be aware, you're going to be like, when do we move things? When do we do feng shui? Uh, You're doing it the whole time. But as you start learning, getting grounded in infinite possibility, starting living with more intention. And as you start bringing this together in space, you start to, as you're doing it for yourself, you start to see how you can do it for others. So it's an experiential training. You're really working on things. You're not learning just data. It's an incredible amount of data, but it's really fun because you're practicing it the whole way. So you learn everything to feng shui your own home life. Uh, We even do personal elements and balance and all of these practices that I found are, I, it's beyond anything that I've ever imagined. And it's not because of me. I I'm so grateful for all the people who are willing to experiment with me and come along for the ride with me. And so as people get this download of all the things for six months, you wind up with a feng shui at home, but you also have this practice that you can incorporate into your coaching, a lot of health coaches, a lot of human design coaches, uh, interior designers, of course, realtors, And people from all over the world who've just been fascinated, they Mm -hmm. love design, they love healing, they love transformation. And sometimes it's easier to help people with external things than it is to do actual therapy, you know, than it is to actually get or get into coaching or get into these things. But you're playing this key part because you can't separate you from your environment. And I think that's the conversation that I've been having a lot with people now is you can change your diet. You can change the way you think you can change all of these things, but if you don't change your environment, everything's more difficult. If your environment doesn't shift, you're living. It's like 
imagine if you went to the theater and there were two different productions and like there was a production during the day and one at night and they just decided that they didn't feel like changing the set. And then the second production came on and it was like oh, the same old and people didn't get it. They were like, wait, this is not the set I need. Like I need a new set. Like oh, we're doing a new thing now. And um, it really kind of holds you back because you can't interact with your space in the same way. You need to shift your space in order to fully expand into all the things, whether that's by decluttering, uh, shifting the energy, or really just transforming your space. So the, the level up and the way to really make changes that stick that I've seen and very much in synergy with all of these other healing modalities and everything else is that you really, when you start working with your environment, suddenly things start working. The manifestation things start working, the habit shifts start working, everything starts working better because now you have all the pieces together. <laughs> now it's like, oh, I have the set. I've done all my rehearsals. I've done my practice. I know how to perform this theater piece, but now I have the proper set so that I can operate. And so it really does make a huge difference. And we forget, we talk about influence, like how we're influenced by media. We're influenced by influencers. We're influenced by all these things, but your actually biggest influence is your environment all day wow. long, every minute of the day what wow. it smells like, what it feels like, what, how you feel sitting in your chair right now, how whoever's listening to this feels was they're walking around, like what you, what it feels like when you lay down in bed, like all of these things influence us. If you like, if it's really cold right now where you are and you get into bed and your sheets are cold, like you feel that like it's, and it registers all of this stuff. It, it's like night and day, the changes that you can make when this comes into play. And this is the one aspect of wellness and we'll say life optimization for lack of a better mm -hmm. word that isn't really talked about a lot. And a lot of the reason is because um, I think, and what I've been told is that people try to get into feng shui and certain schools of it, certain ways that it's presented don't really fit with themselves, with their life. They get confused. It's mm -hmm. difficult to understand. So one of the reasons why I do all this YouTube and all this stuff and everything else is to help people to see that, no, you can actually make this really easy. And it still, it doesn't still work. It actually works in my experience brilliantly and consistently because you are doing it for you. Thank you so much for sharing this information. I know you've completely changed the way I'm going to look at my home or I do look at my home right now. Um, and it actually has made me excited to have intentions for my space um, and to make intentions for my life that reflect my space. This has just changed my whole outlook. I'm really, I'm really excited. So thank you. Um, oh, so I'm we're, so happy to hear this. Yeah, this is like, you know, I apologize if I'm at a loss for words or a little glazed over. <laughs> it's just because I'm looking around and I have so much going on in my mind and there's so much possibility now. You know, I think often when we're in a space, it's easier to see the limitations and then make excuses about the limitations instead of just seeing pure possibility. Um, so thank you for shifting that. And I hope that's shifted in anyone who's listening today too. That is so amazing. And that's what we talked about at the beginning, this idea of, you know, leaning into this, like everything is possible. And I love, oh, I love hearing that. And if I can help in any way, I'm here to be a resource for you. Absolutely. Whenever, whenever you need to do day trips down to Orange County, um, I could definitely fill up your calendar. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, where can people continue to learn with you and from you and take your course um, or connect with you? Where can you recommend they find you? So everywhere on social media, I am at the Dow of Dana, T-H-E-T-A-O-O-F-D-A-N-A, -A -A, the Dow of Dana. 
And you can also find all of the programs, the school, everything at fengshuimagical.com, F-E-N-G-S-H-U-I, and then magical.com. And so you can find everything there. You can reach out to me. Um, I'm always excited to hear from people if you have questions on social media, but I'm constantly sharing things on Instagram, on YouTube, like TikTok everywhere. Um, and I love making content for people as well. So if y'all have questions and things you want me to make a video about, ask me. Yeah, you're an incredible online teacher. I'm really impressed by um, the content and information that you share with others so they can start making shifts in their lives. And I hope anyone that's listening today goes forward and, and looks you up on your website and your social media handles because you're a great, great teacher. I'm so honored. And thank you so much for these really powerful questions. I feel like I wasn't expecting this at all. It's awesome. Oh, and I didn't even get to all the questions I had for you today. So, so another time, um, but this was a great introduction to the type of feng shui you do, um, which is really an internal conversation one needs to have with themselves. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank all you right. Talk me. to you soon. Bye.